Hey there, Wendy here with Jazzy Doodle Designs, and today we're going to do another one in Mino Risa Dirch Africa. So I thought it might be kind of fun, before I forget, I am going to do this page because I want to use the same colors. Let me get you in camera there. I want to use the same colors that I used in this page, in this page, so that the two pages kind of coordinate. So kind of my thoughts are to use this tapestry color here on this piece. We'll make our globe kind of look like our map. We'll have the red brick that I used here will be used on the red. The green for the tree, of course. Uh, the trunk will be the same colors here. Um, and then probably a little bit down here of these wood colors. And then I will be adding, you know, there's a lot of doodads. So there may be some additional colors or I may just try and we'll see how all of that goes as we go along. We'll get the bulk of it colored and then we'll start fussing with, you know, what color are we going to do our little tabby and what color, you know, will all these like the pot and stuff be. So we'll just have to see how it goes. But grab your polychromos, because that's what I used last time, and let's begin. Special shout out to Diamond Slash Ranch, who suggested that I post the pencils that I use in the color along at the beginning so that y'all can prepare. I always welcome your suggestions to improve the channel. So thank you so much for that one. I do feel like that's a good addition. So I'll be trying to do that uh, for each color along. So how is everyone doing? I feel like it's been a while. I've got a lot going on right now. Um, I'm selling my businesses. I have three. <laughs> so it's, um, there's a lot in preparing for that and it's kind of bittersweet, but, um, but yeah, we'll talk more about that as we go along. So basically what I'm doing here is I am very lightly, you can see how far back um, on the pencil that I'm holding, I just want to lay down a little bit of color. Of course, I missed a spot. You guys are shocked. But um, I just want to lay down an initial color of that, um, what is it, brown ochre, the 96, um, the lightest color. And then I'm going over it with this Bistra and I'm going to keep adding some darker layers to the outside edge where the artist has given me lines to indicate that there would be shadows. So I'm doing that and the key to this is you just want to lay down light layers. Now Polychromos is the perfect pencil for that because that's how they work best. But then as you put down each layer, you're just going to put in the darker colors, not pulling them out quite as far into each, you know, into the center. Because I want that center part to be lighter. So now there isn't a whole lot I can say about this process for a little while. So what I thought we would do is with each page, I have been doing a little research on Africa because it's a country that has always kind of fascinated me. Even as a kid, I always wanted to go to Botswana. Now, I don't know if I truly wanted to go to Botswana or if I just really liked the name Botswana, but it was something that, um, I don't know. I wouldn't say as a kid, it was like as a young adult, um, I just thought it would be the coolest country. And I think it's because there's a lot of animals and stuff down there. But what I thought we, I would do is on each of these color alongs, when it's 
you know, pretty obvious what I'm doing on, on the screen, I would tell you some fun facts about Africa. So today I thought we would start with some of the basics and then as we go into the pages that talk about Victoria Falls, then I'll give you facts about Victoria Falls. Or if we're looking at penguins, we'll talk about the penguins. So that's kind of my thoughts. Um, I thought it would add a little bit of something something to the color of lungs so that we can all become a little more educated because quite honestly some of the things that I've learned have kind of surprised me. Things that I, I don't know if I just never really thought about them or um, but there were there's quite a few facts that really surprised me. So um, First, like I said, just some basic things. Africa is the second largest continent in the world. And for perspective, um, it gives you how many square miles. I don't know about y'all, but when I hear that kind of stuff, I'm like, what does that mean? Like, is that a lot? I mean, it, it always sounds like a lot because it's like 11.6 um, um, square million square miles or something like that. Um, so the way it works better for my brain is to just consider that Africa is about three times as big as the United States. Now that puts it in perspective for me because then I can go, oh, <laughs> oh. But what I thought was really interesting is Africa actually has less shoreline than Europe. Um, so... That was kind of interesting to me, and I think it's because Europe has a lot of um, bays and inlets, whereas Africa doesn't really have those. It actually kind of bulges um, out, and so I thought that was kind of an interesting fact. Um, there's over a billion people there, 1.4 billion people, and I think these are, I mean, these stats that I got are from different places and different times, but this one's like 2019 maybe. Um, they say that there are over 1,500 different languages spoken there, and one in every four languages spoken is only spoken in Africa. And I think it's because there's a lot of Aboriginal tribes and... Um, and you know the different um i don't i am so bad at this but like the different sects of people we'll call them tribes that have their own languages and i found that very interesting but one of the things that surprised me the most is that um arabic was the most common language spoken and i'm not sure what language I thought was the most common, I maybe Afrikaans, um, I don't know. See, I, I acknowledge I'm very ignorant in a lot of ways. Um, so that's why I thought this would be kind of fun that we could learn these kind of things together. Um, they say that the world's civilization began in Africa and it dates back to uh, 3300 BC. Uh, Islam is the most dominant religion in Africa, with Christianity being second. Um, it is the most centrally located continent in the world, and it's divided almost equally in half by the equator, with more of the country being in the northern part, just simply because you know, the little bulge of Africa there on the side, um, just kind of, it's, it's like, if you looked at the map, it's like 50, 50, but more, there's actually more region, uh, north of the equator. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually going to put a little bit of a darker layer on that inside curve of our filigree there. And that's going to um, give it more of a 3D effect. And then on the little circle-y part 
the little curly Q part, you want to add a little darkness as well. This will just add a little depth and dimension to your page. So we're going to repeat the process here on the other side, and then I'm going to go in with a darker color and really deepen up the edges of the curve part. So if you look at the whole C, like where the top and the bottom of the C are, that's where I'm adding this Van Dyke Brown, leaving that center section just a little bit lighter. This gives the illusion of that curve, or at least it's, <laughs> I'm hoping it does. But you just want to, you want to do this and then I, let's see what I do. I don't want to tell you wrong. But you can see how those, those little, the lighter areas then kind of pop out a little bit. And then when I go in with my white Posca pen at the end, I'm, it'll really stand out. Now, once again, we're trying to create a little bit of dimension here. So by going around the edges, and then I'm going to go in with the next uh, darkest, next lightest color, I should say. So this is the darkest one. And then I'm going to keep adding. Okay, I guess we're going to have a few blooper reels this, <laughs> this go around. Um, I'm going to leave the center of that little strip there lighter. So you can see I went in with my darkest, the Van Dyke. Now I'm, I'm kind of shading back into the center ever so slightly. I don't want to go all the way to the center with the Bistra. And then I'm going to go in with the brown ochre and, and blend it all out. But I want to leave that very lightest um, whatever color was the first color, this ivory yellowish color, uh, we want to make sure that we're leaving some of that in the center so that we have that almost like a curved look. You can see when we're all done that it, it makes it look rounded as opposed to before when it was just the lines, it looks squared off. I hope in all of my blabbing, <laughs> you managed to, to understand me. I guess I'm speaking Afrikaans. <laughs> I might as well be for all the sense I'm making probably. But, but that's kind of what we're doing here. But you can see, I feel like it, it gives it a much more rounded appearance when you do this. And I'm hoping that when you guys take these techniques, you can then apply them to other pages. Yeah, so here's the cream. And we want to make sure that we have that cream there in the center. And then I'm just going over that filigree as well because we never did that. Um, but I... I, I almost wish I would have just colored one half of this and left the other half for you to get that visual because I do think it makes a big difference. So I wanted to interrupt our history, <laughs> our, our Africa lesson, just to, to tell you why I was doing what I'm doing. And the darker you make that centerpiece right there, the more recessed it's going to look, the more deep it's going to look. Um, because the idea is that if it's really dark, um, no light is getting there. I apologize, but I had to turn my book. Um, I try very hard not to do that so y'all don't get um, seasick. But, um, but I want to blend this out a little bit more. Just try and make it a smooth transition between, you know, the three colors. But I really think it adds a lot. And you can really see how that darker really adds some dimension as well. Personally, I think if there's one thing that you can do to improve your pages, in my opinion, um, 
I like a lot of contrast in my pages. I want to see these darks to lights. I think too often if somebody asks me, how can I improve this picture? 95% of the time, they don't have enough contrast in their colors. They're afraid of going too dark. And it's often in, mostly not going dark enough. And guys, this is not me judging, because believe me, there are much better artists out there that are doing phenomenal painting, you know, pictures, um, and are doing it better. But that's okay. That just gives me something to aspire to and something to learn from. And, um, and there aren't, there isn't a right way. So when I say that, I mean things that I like. Some people really like all muted tones, like all pastels, like the entire page being done in pastel. That's what appeals to them. And, and so the best way for them is to do it that way. They might not like my pictures at all. They might say, oh, I don't like the dark light stark contrast. So take what I say and throw out what you don't agree with because that's how you're going to develop your style is each time you listen to somebody you're going to take what you like about what they say or what they do and add it to your repertoire and all the stuff they do that you don't like you get to throw that in the trash because this is your art um so don't be afraid to do art on your own terms. <laughs> don't let it boss you around. Um, but anyway, I'm kind of applying the same principle here around this side. However, I did it a little bit differently. On this one, I have put my darkest tone in the center, and this is going to make it look like it curves in, kind of like crown molding. You know how the crown molding has that little, um, it doesn't bulge out, it curves in. Uh, that was kind of the look I was going for. I don't know if I was quite as successful. Um, I think it probably needs a, a darker line, the Van Dyke Brown as well. And maybe I'll get to it, I don't know. But, but anyway. That's the whole principle of what I'm doing here. This is just like we did at the very beginning, just laying down that, that base layer. Okay, so back to Africa. Um, did you know that the shortest distance between Africa and Europe is only 8.9 miles of ocean? That is wild to me absolutely wild. Now, coming from someone that lives in the United States, now I've, I've lived in Europe, um, and so I'm aware. <laughs> um, but I'm not, I'm not a good person for like, um, spatial orientation, I guess is maybe what they call it. Like my husband and I can be driving and he can visualize what's on the other side of the mountains. He can, he can say, well, this place is here in relation to that place, um, both on a map and in real life. And I, I just struggle with that. I am the person that when I drive out of a subdivision, <laughs> almost always turn the wrong way. And you know, thank God for the GPS map thing. Uh, when I was running my business and I went to jobs, I could pretty much bet that if I just thought I should go right, I should probably just go left because, I, yeah, um, that is not my strong spot for sure. Um, now, 
in town, like driving around in town, I don't have any problems. Like I'm pretty good at knowing where I'm going and that kind of stuff. But there's something about that. I don't know. I'm digressing, but, um, it, I just thought that was a, re like a stat that blew me away. Um, Africa's Nile River is the world's longest river. It is 4,132 miles, which is 6,650 kilometers for those of you across the pond. Um, and it goes across 11 countries. It drains into the Mediterranean Sea from Africa's northeastern edge. Now, I've always known that the Nile was a large river and um, we'll talk about that more when we go to the to the Nile page but it's still hard for me to wrap around that it's 4,132 miles because the United States from end to end okay so from end to end the US is 2,892 miles so the Nile could go all the way across the United States and then more than halfway back. That is wild to me. <laughs> I mean, it, I just want to go to Africa now. Okay, so now we're starting on our trunk. Let's, uh, we're doing the same kind of principle. Um, I'm darkening the edges. I want the trunk to look a little rounded. I also want it to look like that the little strips are, um, you know, on top of the trunk as opposed to, you know, being flat. Um, I also want it to look a little bit older. I think that when you deepen the edges like this, it gives it a more vintage look, which I kind of like. But I'm basically you know, just applying the same principles, the dark, the light, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you don't like the deep contrast, just, you know, lighten up your lightest uh, Wendy <laughs> words. <laughs> um, lighten up your darkest layer or don't even put the darkest layer in. You know, leave off the Van Dyke brown and just go in with your whatever that was, uh, Sienna brown. That's always an option because these are your pictures and I am just showing you how I do it. Oh, which brings me to my next shout out. I want to shout out Sherry Denowitz. I hope I said your name right, Sherry, because you know I'm terrible with names. But she helped me come along with, she helped me design the hashtag Color Along with Jazzy Doodle Designs. So as you all do these color alongs, if you would like to, um, I would absolutely love to see your work. And the best way for me is if you use this hashtag so that I can go to one place and look at all of your lovely designs. Um, I think it would be fun, especially since so many of you are doing the color along in the Africa book. You can go in and be inspired by people that were inspired by me. <laughs> that sounds so wild. But, um, but anyway, thank you so much, Sherry, for helping me think that through. And um, so I will put that hashtag in the description and that'll be on every color along that I do from now on. I will put it in the description box. But um, I encourage you, share your art with me. I would really love to see it. Um, that's the kind of stuff that drives me to create more content and yeah, it's why I do what I do because I absolutely love it. I love the interaction with you because I don't care what anybody says. I have the best community 
in all of the color world. Um, you guys are just phenomenal. And I would love to give back to you because you all inspire me to do better. All right, so back to our little trunk here. I'm just kind of blending it out, adding a little more uh, darkness where I think I need some. And in true Jazzy Doodle Design fashion, I am going to leave the, the little stickers for the end so that I know what colors I want to put in them. But I'm basically going to... Well... I guess I wasn't quite done. Sorry. I think I do all the silver stuff right now as well. It's the bad thing about kind of voicing over is I'm trying to rush myself along. Come on, Wendy. No more blending. Let's move. <laughs> but really, take your time at this point. You can see it really does make a big difference to add that next layer. But I'm just going in with the lightest cool gray and then I'll go in with cool gray 3 and then cool gray 5. Now if you want them darker you could use uh, cool gray 7, 5, and 3 um, if you wanted to or you could um, you could go in with 1 and, and just 7. You just want a nice contrast between um, the darkest here. I think this is the only time, sidebar, <laughs> this is the only time I use this Payne's Gray. You could use your Cool Gray 5 at this point, or you could even use, um, what is it, Dark Sepia would work there too, or Black, um, just to do those little, probably Black would be my choice to use um, instead of Payne's Gray. I I must have just had that on my, on my table, but when I was going through the colors and lining them all up, I didn't see where I would used it, so I, it won't be in the list of used colors. But as always, anytime you do a color along, there's always options. If you don't have Payne's Gray, use black. If you, or a dark gray, like Cool Gray 7. Um, there's, you know, use what you have, um, I guess is what I'm saying. Now, once again, with that silver, while I'm thinking of it, and while we're not even coloring it, um, I will go back with the white Posca pen, and that white will help make it look more shiny. Um, the more dark you go and light on a piece, the more shiny it's going to look. But now I'm basically using the exact same principle that I've used on the wood and on the trunk is I'm going in with the dark on the outer edges and then the lighter in the middle, which is going to add a little bit of dimension to the map. It makes those continents kind of pop off. Now I will say, because you know, this is a Jazzy Doodle design color along, I totally miss one little peat land mass there um, to the right hand side and the bot on the bottom there you see it's not colored at all yeah well I would encourage you to color it while you're doing all the other ones so you don't have to pull out all your pencils um, because you know it's just what I do I have to it's like a, a prerequisite I just have to miss something <laughs> So while I do that, let's pop into our Africa facts again. Uh, the largest country is Sudan, which has 2.5 million uh, kilometers and the small uh, squared. And the smallest country is Sigelis, which is an island nation covering only 453 square kilometers or 175 square miles. So it's a very small island. Okay, so 
The largest island in Africa is in the Indian Ocean and it's Madagascar. And we'll definitely talk about it more when we get there. But it's the fourth largest in the world. Victoria Falls is one of the seven natural wonders. And it's uh, the Zimbabwe River or the Zambezi River's main water source. The largest lake is Lake Victoria, and it's the second largest freshwater lake in the world, uh, spanning 26,830 square miles. Okay, because I'm a visual girl, that lake is roughly the size of the entire state of West Virginia. <laughs> I just... I don't know. It's crazy to me. Like, Africa has some really cool stuff. It, it really makes me want to go visit. Now, don't get me wrong. Last year, we went to Michigan and saw the Great Lakes. And Lake Superior is the world's largest freshwater lake. And it was enormous. It looked like an ocean. It literally had almost like tides, like waves, because, you know, it's so big. But, you know, we're not, you know, I'm just trying to give you some perspectives because I like to see things and stuff like that. Because when people tell me about acreage, I, I mean, I just don't even know what that means. I'm like, is that big? <laughs> You gotta like tell me, yeah, it's the size of Florida. I'm like, oh, okay, now I know how big it is. <laughs> so, speaking of big things, Africa has the Sahara Desert, which is the world's largest hot desert. And um, the only other deserts that are bigger are cold deserts. So, like in the Arctic and stuff, I guess they consider that a desert. Um, the highest point in Africa is Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania, which is 19,340 feet or 5,895 um, meters above sea level. Now, I live in Colorado and we have a lot of what we call the 14ers because they're over 14,000 feet. And, you know, some people think that's fun to go hike up them. <laughs> yeah, I laugh at those people. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I have a lot of respect for that. My husband hikes at Timberline a lot. And, you know, you just, it's a whole different world up there. And for those of you that live at sea level and come and visit, um, I had a friend from Australia come and visit me. And we went up to Rocky Mountain National Park and she really struggled with the altitude or the elevation because elevation sickness can be a real thing um, because the oxygen is so much thinner. Now I've lived at, I don't know, we live at like 5,300 feet. So it isn't near as big of a jump for me because at that point we were probably at about eight or 9,000 feet. Um, and I'm in the mountains frequently. We like to camp and, and do the things. Um, but that's a really big jump if you live at sea level. So, but I still think it's wild that, you know, Count Mount Kilimanjaro is like a whole nother 5,000 feet <laughs> above our humongous mountains. So, um... Speaking of tall things, the world's tallest and largest land animals come from Africa. They're the giraffe and the African elephant. Um, and the giraffe is already extinct in at least seven African nations. Well, that's a sad fact. I had no idea that there were problems with giraffes being extinct. Um... But, you know, I try and keep things positive on the channel. So when we talk about Africa, there are a lot of things that we could talk about um, that do make things sad. 
you know, um, there, and, and I'll probably bring these up here and there, but I really want to focus on the positive because we could talk about malaria. We could talk about HIV. We could talk about, um, illiteracy and, and different things like that. Um, but I want this channel to be a place where you go to get away from all of that because that stuff is on the news every single day. We hear about tragedy. We hear about horrendous child abuse and um, pedophiles and just, just <gasps> awful things. And we live in a world that is more divisive than I've ever known it to be. And so I want to create a space where we talk about things that are positive and fun and good about the world because there is so much good in the world. And so you won't hear me talk about a lot of those other things, um, as whether we're talking about Africa or whether we're talking about life in general, just because I really want this to be a safe space to, to get away from it all and to pour ourselves into art and creativity and, and use it to, you know, fill our cup up because all the things, whether they're good or bad in our life, uh, drain from our cup, whether we're taking care of our kids or our family, whatever your family looks like, your spouse, your pet, whatever, all of those things um, take a little bit away from our cups. And as, you know, let's face it, you know, guys, close your ears for a minute because predominantly my channel is driven by women. And as women, we are the caretakers, we're the nurturers, we're the people that are making, you know, like life decisions for our kids and things like that. And don't get me wrong, my husband was a, a great father. And um, so this is not a dig on men at all. I think men, men um, I don't agree with the whole, like, we should be everything that men should be. I think men and women should be men and women. <laughs> um, but that being, you know, that, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not digging on men. I'm just saying that as women, we tend to take care of others and have a hard time taking care of ourselves. And so I want my channel to be a place that anyone can come and feel included and feel good about themselves and be exposed to positive things. And let's leave the, you know, now don't get me wrong, I love me some true crime and um, I don't know why. I, I don't know if that says something bad about who I am, but, um, but to me that's a different, that's a different space than what I want to create here. If you want to read about true crime, there are some great channels out there that do podcasts and whatnot, but, um, you know, that's not this channel. So, okay. Um, so the hippopotamus is Africa's deadliest animal. It kills more people in Africa than crocodiles and lions combined. Now, I knew this fact, um, but it's still interesting to me because if you ask the average 10-year-old, like, hey, what is the scariest animal on the planet? I don't think hippopotamuses would even make the top 10. <laughs> they just, they're, they don't have that reputation. Lions, tigers, bears, sharks. Now, you know, um, you know, I get, I guess land mammals or whatever, but I'm just saying crocodiles, um, 
These are all things that people think of as scary. Snakes, spiders. Uh, when was the last time they said, oh, scary hippopotamus? <laughs> but they are cantankerous little animals. And I think it's interesting where I come from. People don't understand that moose are also that way. They're mean little critters. And I often see people wanting to take pictures or, or whatever. And I think sometimes that Rocky Mountain National Park does um, visitors a little bit of a disservice because the elk in Rocky Mountain National Park are very tame. They're used to people. They're used to being around people. And so they will let you get closer than you should get. And you will get to see them on a very up close and personal level because they're literally on the golf course. Um, but that is not what it's like in real life. Um, when you're up in the mountains and you, you know, an elk sees you, they run. They're not like hanging out like, hey dude, what's up? <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and eat while you take pictures. No, that is not reality. And um, places like Yellowstone and Rocky Mountain National Park definitely um, create kind of a an unreal expectation for what those animals are truly like. And, um, but, wow, this is Tangent Tuesday, I guess. It's not even Tuesday. I guess it's Thursday, so <laughs> we're Tangent Thursday, where Wendy just goes off on random topics. Uh, so, apologies, people. Um, not a lot to say about what I'm doing here. It's pretty much the same thing I've done on the entire page. Create darker corners, work, work my lighter colors into the middle. Also, most of the colors are the same colors that I've used, uh, throughout. I use them in a little different combination, or I use a little bit more darker colors here, um, because I want the bookshelf is going to be in shadow, right? Like there's not as much light hitting that back wall as would be hitting, the, you know, the, the first thing that we colored, whatever that is, the front of the bookcase. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, so that's why I'm using the darker colors. All right, so this was an interesting fact to me as well. In Africa, just like in Asia, people have to walk an average of 3.7 miles daily to fetch water for various uses. Now, we live in, I mean, I can't speak for all of my subbies, but a lot of you live in the United States and we have running water. We want water, we just walk to the kitchen and turn on the tap. Um, I know when I was in Poland, you know, years ago, a lot of, they had running water in the tap, like where I was staying, at least was just outside of Krakow, um, or Krakow, if you want to be proper about it. Um, you would turn on the water and water came out. However, they didn't have running hot water. So if you wanted to take a bath, you had to heat water and carry it up, um, to take a bath. And obviously showers, they didn't have showers. They just had baths. Um, which to me, I remember being so like, like shocked by all of this. Now in the cities, a lot of the apartment buildings and stuff, some of those did have running hot water, but the water was piped in from like a factory. And then it was piped in these insulin. And bear in mind, this was all explained to me in Polish, which I spoke Polish at the time, but you know, we all know how that goes if you learn another language. You're not exactly proficient in technical terms and things like that. So my understanding of how that worked was 
they were piped in these, and you saw them, they were like these humongous pipes, but they were like insulated pipes, and they would pipe them to these buildings, um, which I thought was just, I mean, it was so far from what I knew. Now, I'm going to pause my story here because I want to talk about these bricks. So, because that's why you came here. Um, so, what I've done is I've taken Indian Red and Burnt Sienna and, and probably Brown Ochre. I can't remember. But you'll see me. I am just randomly placing these three colors in the bricks. So... I didn't want the bricks to be all burnt sienna or all um, Indian red or whatever. I wanted there to be some variants. So now the majority of the colors are these two colors. But then I think I blend them out with brown ochre. But, you know, you just want, you just want to add some variants because bricks are not all, oh yeah, burnt ochre not brown ochre. That way I get a little of the orangey tones. And I really like the looks of this because bricks are not unified. They're not all the same flat color. And so by doing it this way, um, each brick turns out a little different. Now I do miss a couple of bricks because you know, well, if you know, you know. Um, so <laughs> you'll see me add them in later on. But it's, um, but anyway, this is one way that you can make bricks. It's not the only way. Um, the other thing that you could do to add a little visual interest is you can take like a fine liner in maybe black and just add a few dots in the brick because you know how brick is kind of um, porous. And so that'll kind of help create that texture. So if you like that look. I wish I would have thought about that when I was doing this color along, but it's all finished and I've taken the pictures. <laughs> so I probably won't go in and do that. But, um, and I'll do the background to the brick here in a bit. But you know, squirrel, I'm off on the chair. Um, so I'm just going in with my deepest green. Now this is the same greens that we used when we did our curtains before but I'm just going in to where the where the artist has drawn the dark lines that's one good way of deciding where to put your darkest colors also just you can look at reference photos um, but you know you can also just ask yourself where would shadows be right and I'm going to blend from these the darkest color here out um, leaving the overall tone of the chair to be a much lighter green so that's kind of what I'm going to do okay so I'm going to leave you to that and I'll get back to my story about the hot water um, you know as an American, we are just so incredibly spoiled. Oh, okay, I gotta interrupt my story again. See the teapot little thing? Yeah, don't color that green. Um, learn from my mistakes. I started coloring it green right there, and I will color it completely green. <laughs> but pay attention to that when you're doing it so that you don't color it green too and then have to erase it like I did. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, you know, I just feel like as you, it, people in the United States and, and really even in Western Europe, um, though less though than the United States, um, we just take so many things for granted. And to have to walk three and a half miles a day just to get water is just so far from what we do here in the United States. We don't even walk that far to go to the store. Um, you know, we are, we are so spoiled. And this is not a shaming thing. I'm grateful that I live where I do. I don't 
want to walk three and a half miles to get water every day. But I would dare say that the people of that country, that's just, it's what they know. They've always done it, so it doesn't seem odd or unfair or um, they don't really even have an issue with it. Just like when I was in Poland and they would um, heat the house with coal, literally black coal. And I could never figure out where her brother, um, the lady that I went with, her brother would disappear like ever so often. And so I finally ask, I'm like, where's he going? And she's like, oh, he's got to go shovel the coal into the furnace um, to keep it warm. And so I went the next time he went and they had a small room, maybe eight by eight or something like that. And it was literally filled floor to ceiling with a pile of coal and he had a shovel and he would shovel it into the furnace. And I was just blown away. Um, having grown up in Wyoming where they mine for coal, I am no stranger to coal. Um, that being said, never had a coal burning stove ever. Um, so see, there I am covering the little teapot right there. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, you know, but to them it was just like, oh yeah, that's how we heat the house. Just like stating it like, yeah, like what, what, why are you even questioning this? Um, so, you know, um, those are just my little things that I find interesting. But even having been to Poland and experiencing that on that level, it was still a surprising fact to me that they walk that far for water every day. Um, I remember reading a book about a, a kid from Africa, you know, and he didn't have shoes. Like shoes were, um, they were just, they were a novelty, you know. Um, and he got a pen pal from the United States and, and she sent various things. And, uh, and I don't know, it's just... Guys, I would encourage you to read about other places, visit other places. I think one of the best things that we can do for our kids is to facilitate them leaving the United States and going to another country, whether it's Western Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, Africa, you know, I don't know that you even have to go to the most impoverished nations in the world to appreciate what you have. You can go to parts of Mexico that are still like light years above, um, you know, some of these tribal villages in terms of a progression and electricity and running water and heated water and all of the different things, but you can still, it, it gives you an awareness that I don't think you get any other way. And too often times, I think that when you visit, you only visit, um, even, in, even living in Germany, seeing the size of the house that people live in and the fact that they share these generationally a lot of times and sometimes they don't even have um, kitchens and things like that. It, it, it changes how you view the world that you live in. And it changes your awareness of what you have. Because so oftentimes we get caught up in our, you know, woe is me stuff. And, and really um, forget how good we have it. And no, I'm not saying that you, you know, that we need to become a people that's like, oh, we can't have any cool things. We can't, you know, we can't have 500 color books because people are starving in Africa. That's, that is not what I'm saying. I'm just saying those travels made me aware of the world in a different way, which I think is a good thing. That's all I'm saying. Um, doing this book and 
trying to come up with what to say on a two hour color long has made me go, hmm, maybe I should like check out Africa and learn more about it because I'm going to be coloring it for the next year or two, right? And I think that's cool because it forces me with, you know, air quotes on the forces, uh, me to, to learn more about the world that we live in. And that's never a bad thing, is it? I don't think so. So anyway, I promise you not all of my color alongs are like this philosophical and, you know, preachy. And I hope I'm not coming across preachy because I wouldn't like, I, that is not my intention at all. Um, but you know, I just find a lot of these are just really interesting to me. Okay, so how about some more fun facts? How about this one? In Tanzania has the world's highest albinism rates. In the country, albino are hunted by witch doctors to use their organs for rituals believed to heal diseases. Now, I don't know because it doesn't say if they're talking about albinos, I'm assuming, in people. But albinoism is also something that affects animals. Um, I had an opportunity years ago. We were out in the Pawnee National Grasslands, which is kind of like a deserty area. There isn't a whole lot out there. And there's a lot of antelope out there. And there was a couple of deer out there and there was an albino deer and guys I'm out and over the my whole life we have done outdoor things I've only seen one in my entire life in real life um, so it is pretty rare but I thought that was interesting um, let's see in Chad, um, only 13% of the per population of women were literate in 2010, but 92 were literate in that little small island, um, Seychelles. So on that little tiny island, the population's really high. So Mm, is that a skewed fact? Because how many people live on that island? I don't know. So, you know, percent of, you can make stats do anything. So keep that in mind. Um, did you know that in South Africa produces almost half of all the gold mined in, oh, with Waters Rand, South Africa produces almost half of all the gold mined in Africa. More people speak French in Africa than do those in France. Now, see, that's another one of those stats. Is it just simply because there are so many more people in Africa than in France? Because France is a small country. But, you know, I love quirky little stats like that. I think it's fun. You know, here when I'm doing this tree, I was kind of debating to myself what I wanted to do with those kind of leafy spots on it. Um, I was really tempted to like make them yellow or something like that. Maybe that cream color. In the end, I use a Posca pen, but you know, feel free. You could make those leaves really dark. You can make them a, a color. Um, I'm not sure. So go wild with that. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, but I'm using the same technique. The dark on the outside, light on the inside, blend it all out with a middle tone color uh, type of strategy here. Here I found some bricks that I was missing. Oh no, no, I take that back. I'm coloring the trunk. Okay, some more fun facts. And let me know in the comments if you hate that I do this. 
um, then I won't do it. But I kind of think it's fun to have some tr little fun facts. Did you know a single tribe in Kenya called the Kalenjin produces most of the world's fastest long distance runners? Now, I had read something about this one time, and what's interesting is that they almost all run barefooted. <laughs> so, um, I go barefoot a lot, so I understand the desire, but I don't like to go barefoot outside because I don't like pokey things on my feet. But, you know, they build up like a tolerance to that. And um, so I think that's kind of interesting. So now here I'm introducing a completely different color because I wanted a brighter red. I wanted something to make those wings stand out. I thought about doing them gray, thought about doing them blue, thought about doing them white. But I just really thought, no, I wanted them red. And I thought it would work good with this ball of twine down here yarn um, to be able to use the Indian red in the shadows and then that what is it called Pompeian red or whatever in the center because once again adding the darker reds in the crevices gives the illusion of depth Another fun fact, women from Africa's Mercy tribe pierce their lips and wear plates as large as five inches in diameter inside the lips. Now, I have seen pictures of that. I don't even know how you would go about doing that. It looks incredibly painful to me. Like, think about what five inches is. That's like a saucer. Imagine wearing a saucer in your face. Like, um, I often wonder, like, how these things came to be. Like, when the very first people said, hey, I think this would be a good idea. <laughs> you know, there must have been some sort of reason for that, you would think, right? I don't know. I often think these kind of things because, like, to me it makes sense, like, the inventor of postage, right? You're like, hey, I want something that sticks on something and then I can remove it. Makes sense that you invent post-its. But the person that invented meth, they're like, hey, I know, I want to get high. Let's use lie and, I don't know, Drano. <laughs> Sudafed, and I don't know what all goes. I mean, um, in my business, um, I did a lot of like decontamination and stuff like that, so I'm aware of a lot of the things that make up meth and, and that kind of stuff. But I'm like, what were people thinking when they actually created it? Like, like you actually think it's a good idea to use Drano? as something that you're going to ingest in your body in some form. Now, I understand they were probably high when they <laughs> created that, but it's still wild to me to think of how these things come to be. Like, like gauges in the ears. I'm like, um, you know, I see how it becomes a trend. So the second person doing things doesn't surprise me as much as the first person. <laughs> but then again, you know, I come from an area where rodeo is a big thing and bull riding is a big thing. And it's like, you know, people spend their whole lives trying to spend eight seconds on a bull. The first guy says, hey, let's try and ride this thing. But then why does the second guy go, yeah, good idea, after he sees the first guy get thrown in three seconds? <laughs> I guess it's because men always have this challenge accepted <laughs> kind of mentality. Okay, that guy only lasted three seconds. I'm sure I can do it for four. 
and and bull riding begins. I don't know. Wendy, you were so far off topic today. You guys are probably just like, well, I wonder what else we're going to discuss. Maybe underwater hula hooping? <laughs> you never know. Might be, did you have it on your bingo card? It could come up. <laughs> like, when you saw this picture, you thought, I know, I bet she talks about bull riding. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, let's see, what other, whatever fun fact is there? Egypt is Africa's most popular tourist destination. The country receives 10 million visitors a year. And Cairo, Egypt's capital city, is also Africa's largest city. So let's talk about this rug. So, so I put down that yellowish color because it's closest to the fire, right? And then as I get away from the rug, I'm going to add more darker colors and more richer reds. So we got that Pompeian red that we used earlier. And then I'm going to add in, of course, the Indian red, right? Uh, here at the back of the rug the farther away it is from the fire. Now, you could go hog wild and do all kinds of shadowing. I could have put shadows from the grates onto the rug. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's whatever. But to me, I thought this was kind of a nice way to make it look a little interesting. Just with a little bit of a change of color. Now, I'm using very light pressure here when I do this, because if you go in with too um, like strong of a color, especially at the beginning with that yellow, I don't think you're going to get that blendy look that you're going for. Now, here I do put a little bit of a cast shadow from that, um, from the, the leg there, because the artist put a little bit of a cast shadow there as well. And you could make that as dark or as light as you want. I thought it turned out pretty good with just using the Indian red. Now when I burnish at the end with the um, the Caran d'Ache blender, which I, I do, I often do, especially when I use polychromos, because they just, they layer beautifully, but I just don't, like, I could just continue to layer, layer, and layer, 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 like 10 layers to maybe get the same outcome as what I'm going to get when I do the full blender. So, you know, I think it's fantastic when artists do that and they have that kind of patience. Uh, I'm not that girl. Ellie says hi. I'm sure she's spotted a bunny ear. A neighbor or something equally important that I know about. <laughs> Hopefully she's not bugging you. She's in the other room, so. And then I brought in even another color with the scarlet red here just to really help make this a nice smooth blend because this is a rug. Unlike our bricks where it's okay to have chunky color, like a rug is, you know, it's a piece of fabric. It's, it's, while they can be done in gradients and things like that, what I was depicting in this one is the warmth of the fire on it and, you know, moving into a smooth blend of color. You know, I guess when you look at the, the rug, you're not really seeing that the rug is a different color. You're seeing the warmth of the fire. And that's what I'm trying to depict. Okay, let's move into our little tabby cat. Now, you could go with an orange, which would make sense, right? But... The reason I didn't is because, and it, and it would work with our color scheme, but the closest that I've really used in terms of orange is this burnt ochre color. And so I don't really want to introduce 
another color, um, I feel like it make would make the the picture a little more busy. And once again, this is this is just a stylistic approach, right? But when you limit your palette, um, your pages look more cohesive when you're done. Now, I I love color and I love like it makes sense to me that this cat would be orange, but in the end, he's going to be a little more brown orange because that's the color scheme that I've used so far. So if I brought in a brighter orange, like, um, like mineral orange or, um, what is it? Polychromos. You know what I'm talking about? Just more of the, like a quote unquote traditional orange it's going to really stand out and it's going to pop off the page because it's the only thing colored in that color. So I tried to use the cream. I tried to use burnt sienna, tried to use the, the burnt ochre. And that to me, when you look at the cat, he, he doesn't look orange, orange, but at the same time, um, you get the impression that he's kind of an orangish brown cat. But then he kind of blends in with everything else. So just like with everything else in this picture, <laughs> I, I did pretty much the same technique on everything, I think, is we work our way from the darker outside into a lighter center. Now my initial thought was I was going to leave his belly this lighter color, almost making him like an orange and white kind of cat. But then I put that cream down and it just felt a little too yellow or ivory, sorry. But the ivory in the polychromos is still definitely has a yellow cast to it. It doesn't have that gray, um, white, cast it it's it's a very very light yellow and um in other in other sets it might even be called a cream and then the cream in the polychromos is definitely a light yellow so in the end i just felt like it was a little too yellow so i end up going over it um and just kind of like adding more color um, making it, I think the burnt ochre, uh, not burnt ochre, the brown ochre kind of color. Yeah. This color, the brown ochre, I, I end up going over it. Now you can decide for yourself if you like that lighter color. When I was coloring it at the time, I just, I didn't, I just felt like it wasn't what I was going for. Now, Looking at it now, I thought it looked fine. So I don't know that I would have needed to change that. So think about that for your picture. What, what do you think? Um, I always like contrast, but for whatever reason, when I was coloring it, it just wasn't doing it for me. But I will say, watching the color along back, I kind of liked it. So it's whatevs. Okay. So moving along to our teapot, I chose the blue simply because I have the blue in the globe on the left hand side. And this is going to help kind of balance it out on the right hand side. So um, eventually I'm going to use my white Posca and go over like the dots and stuff. But, um, as I, <laughs> um, but anyway, I wanted the, the bottom of the, the, the little pot to be in a darker blue, like on this little pattern here. And and then shade it out on the top with a little bit lighter color. So just kind of moving back and forth. Now, 
as I go along, I'm like, wait a minute, where's the little spout? <laughs> and I realized, you know, that I had colored it. So I got to go in with my eraser here. This is a Derwent battery operated eraser, which I love. Now you can see it's, it did kind of stain it that green because I had went over, you know, a lot of layers. I never noticed it until now. So, you know, my observation skills are on point. But anyway, it can all be fixed, right? So then I decide I want to pull in some of this blue into some of the doodads, right? Because we want to balance, I, I like to balance out my pictures with the color. And I felt like that little pot was a good place to put it. Are you guys all ready for Easter? Okay, so while I'm doing this gray background, I have to show you my nails. I really like the French manicure look. I just think it's a clean look. But sometimes she talks me into putting a little sticker on it, like on the one that I'm coloring right now. I have a shamrock. But I really didn't like the shamrock, so I was I told myself I wasn't going to do that again. But then... She showed me these cute little chicks. Come on, guys. That nerdy little chick. I'm like, so she so she took, she wanted a picture to show, like, her, you know, for nail people or whatever. And um, so she needed captions. So we came up with captions and we're like, everyone loves a nerdy chick. And then for the other one is, it's so exhausting being this cute. But I just love the little chicks on my nails. <laughs> it's just one of those things in life that just kind of make you smile. Um, I feel like for the channel, I, I always want my nails to be attractive in some way. Um, not that you can really see like the stickers so much, but you know... Um, Anyway, it's like the one girly thing I do is my nails, but, um, and they are natural for the most part. Sometimes I break a nail and then she's got to put on the little tip, but then I grow the tip out. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, now for these bricks, I'm doing them exactly the same way as the center. And just so you know, um, I should have done one more layer in those center bricks of that dark sepia just to darken it up and I will do that later but I'm telling you now because you're gonna have the dark sepia out <laughs> you know I try and let you learn from my mistakes but anyway um, the brick walls just kind of poking out so I'm just doing it exactly the same way just adding those little random bits of color to each brick to make them a little bit unique. Now I chose not to do the wall. You could definitely, you know, do the walls all like you could take a cream color and go over everything. I'm fine with the way they turned out in terms of um, just ending with the picture and not, you know, fleshing it out any farther. Um, but certainly do whatever makes you happy. Now, as I go along, this is where it gets a little more complicated because I, you know, how do you balance out all these books and doodads to where your page doesn't look too busy and yet, you know, you have some variety as well. So the way I did it was I'm only using colors that I've already used and I'm just trying to spread them out a little bit um, to where I have a little red here and a little brown here and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, but I also think that you could do like that Indian red. You could do all three of these books right here in, in those colors in the red 
Indian Red Burnt Sienna. And I think that would look fine as well. But this is just kind of how I personally decide on color because a lot of people ask me that. Well, how do you know what color to use? So I'm trying to tell you my thought process behind why I chose to, to color this book this color. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, I have the trunk. And so I am going to bring in a book that's similar colors right up there. But for variants, I don't think I use, maybe I do, but I don't use a lot of that burnt sienna. It's more of the browner tones, right? Um, and then the book next to it, I'm going to bring in some blue. And over here, I'm like, okay, I have a green chair. I have a green tree. Maybe I need something on the left-hand side of the page that has green. So I choose to make this book green and that's kind of how I do it. Now, um, sometimes you can achieve the same balance by choosing to do your books like all in brown tones. Maybe, especially if the books are very similar in design, that makes sense to me. Like if you were coloring a large library and all the books have a similar look, then if you did all of them in the same colors, it would kind of look like an encyclopedia, right? Where you've got all these books that match. And that would look good as well. But because, like, this book is so wildly different than the other books. Now, in my mind, I pictured all those little doodads, um, the little swirly bits, in, um, in gold like an embossed, right? And I even pulled out all of my gold pens, but then in the end I was like, I don't have any other gold shiny bits in either side of the page. So I'm gonna choose not to do it. And so in the end, I think I chose white, but that is how I came to that decision of why to do what I do. Now, I will say this, I didn't use any white Posca on the left-hand page, highlighting things. Um, but I chose to do it on this side. And I don't feel like it's a big enough distraction that one side has it and one side doesn't. Um, but I do feel like a gold metallic, adding a gold metallic to one side and not to the other. Uh, oh, excuse me, you guys. Um, might be more noticeable, might be more distracting. Um, once again, artistic choice for sure. There are certain colorists out there that use a lot of shiny um, metallic stuff on all their pages and I love their pages I look at them and I go oh I like the shiny and whatever when I use them on my pages almost always um, if I'm using shiny I usually go all out <laughs> it's pretty rare that I'll have a page like this where it's all colored in colored pencil and then um, I just have like two little highlights of gold, right? Like on that book or something. For me, I like, like in my, if you saw my Alien Worlds page where I did that astronaut and then I had all the little, um, the little bugs and stuff. I, I did a lot of shimmer on that page in the wings and in the crystals and that kind of stuff. And to me, it made sense, but little tiny pops of color in a predominantly matte picture just generally isn't the look that I go for. But like I said, I have seen people pull that off and have it look fabulous. So it is certainly just whatever um, appeals to you because you could bring in, you could have that globe be, you could use like a gold um, 
metallic pen, like a gel pen, and then emboss the book in the gold, and then have the tray in silver and the buckles on the uh, trunk be done in silver, um, the little stand that the airplane's on, that could be done in a metallic, um, I would probably do it in silver, but um, it could be even gold or in front of the fireplace could be shiny. It could be a glaze pen or it could be like a black glitter or it could even be gold or silver. So there is a ton that you can do. Um, you know, you could use a glaze pen on the camera lens. And I think that those pages would turn out fantastic. I didn't do that on this page, but I can picture it in my mind. The same as the clock on the left hand side could have been done in a gel pen and the silverware could have been done in a gel pen and the lenses on the um, sunglasses could have been a, a black glaze pen. So there's a there's more than one way to color a page and have it look amazing. To me, I just feel like it needs to be cohesive. So if you add those kind of things, I think there should be other elements in the page that also have them. But that's just, that's just me. And I really like how these two pages came out. I feel like they go well together. I've really enjoyed coloring them. And, um, and so I'm not unhappy with the choices that I made, you know, using colored pencil for the silver bits instead of the shiny silver pen. But once again, that doesn't mean my choices are right. They're just my choices. And, you know, I think color alongs are great. They can teach us different techniques and different ways to view things. I see people that do things a totally different way than I do. And I go, hmm. And then it makes me jumpstart my next page. Right? It gives me an idea to do on another page. So here I decided that I wanted to bring in that cream color. We've got it a little bit in our tabby cap. We got it in our fire. But really the fire is the only thing that reads yellow, right? The tabby cat still is more brown. But we got that pillow and we got the fire. And then I wanted to bring that into the top up there. And I thought this would be a good place to do it. Now here I'm going in with the darker centers and then light on the tips and I'm actually going to use Posca pen um, on the tips as well just to really emphasize the white. But I feel like it does a good job of kind of balancing that yellow out a little bit. Just going in with a little more shading. I'm not trying to mark on every single line, just kind of randomly here and there. I apologize for all the background noise. We got dogs barking outside because the neighbors putting in like they upgraded their electrical system. And so the neighbor, the other neighbor dogs are all a Twitter about it. My, that gets my dog all a Twitter. My husband's home. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. 
so not exactly ideal conditions <laughs> for color for the voiceover part of the color along. But that's okay. We're going to make do, right? Hopefully it's not too annoying. I think it's interesting. I think sometimes it bothers us as creators more than it does as listeners. Although I have been on people's channel that I'm like, why are you even doing this right now? Because they literally have like construction workers in their house and they're like, yeah, sorry about the noise. And it's like obnoxiously loud. You know what I mean? It's like hammers hammering in the background. And I'm just, to me, that's a little different when I, sometimes I hear, um, do you ever watch Lindsay the Frugal Crafter? I love her, but, um, she, she often talks about like when her furnace comes on and stuff and it's, to me, it's hardly noticeable. Sometimes I can kind of hear it, but it's like this background whooshy noise, not like this obnoxious, like if I'm banging, right? Um, but I think, yeah, it's, it's interesting to me because I have, I have watched channels where like I'm all pet friendly, kid friendly, um, but you know, they're like, they're doing a video and their kid is like sitting right next to them chattering, like totally chattering. And sh the creator is like totally ignoring it and just basically kind of talking over it. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Like I'm interested in what you have to say and what you're showing me. Um, I don't know. It's, but then, you know, other times I'll, I'll see people or channels and, you know, we all have that random background music or, or things you can't control, not background music, but like things you can't control. Like I can't control if my neighbor's dog barks and I never know when that's going to happen. So I can't control it in any way. So I just kind of have to work around it. And while it's not ideal and I wish he would shut up when I'm voicing over at the same time, I feel like it's, it's far enough in the background that it's not like a deal breaker, right? Guess that's what I'm saying. This is what happens when I have long videos. <laughs> it's a crazy amount of time to try and talk about. And quite honestly, it's like, do you really want me to say, well, I put blue here. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can find a few more facts here. Um, so Africa accounts for 18% of the world's population. Um... One third of Africa is covered by deserts. There are 10 hot deserts spanning across country borders in Africa. Wow, just wow. Like I knew the Sahara was there, but I didn't realize so much of it was, uh, was desert, just simply because when I think of Africa, I guess I think of like, the, like a safari, right? With like animals and, and, and that kind of stuff, which I don't, I mean, I realize that there are animals on the desert as well, but I, I don't know. You know, sometimes I think it's, it's things that you just never think about. It's not that you necessarily believe something different. It's just, you never really thought about it. Yeah, sorry about that. I wrote down chrome oxide green and then started coloring with another green. Um, African continent covers 20% of the Earth's surface. Cape Town is the most southernmost city in the African continent. And the point 
is known as the Cape of Good Hope. Um, let's see. Remember when we were talking about the hippos? So here's a fun fact. They kill 3,000 people per year. Wow. And they can weigh up to 1,500 kilograms. Okay, so now i got to go do some conversions. One moment, please. Okay, I'm back. 1,500 kilograms is 3,307 pounds. That's a wow. Even Ellie thought it was a wow. I'll be so glad when the neighbors are done with their... Um, their electrical issues. Okay, so they are the third biggest animal in Africa behind the African elephant and the rhino. Not only are they large, but they're also fast and can run 30 kilometers per hour. All right, must convert. Okay, for those of us that use the dumb system, uh, that is is 18 miles an hour. That's pretty quick because I think the average human, like the fastest we can run, is like under 20. Like super fast, people could maybe run 20 miles an hour. I did, there was a, um, like the Bolt, what is that guy's name? He has a interesting name. I think he's from Africa, isn't he? Usain Bolt. I think he's from Kenya. Not sure. But he ran 29 miles an hour or 27, something like that. But he was sprinting. Like, you know, what you can do for 100 yards is a little different. Now, I want to talk about that last pencil I did. Probably in retrospect, it would have been better to make that pencil like a blue color or even a green color because I feel like the red really kind of blended in with my rug and my fireplace. So note to self, it wasn't big enough deal for me to erase it, but if you were doing it, you may want to consider a different color just simply because I feel like the red uh, just it just looks kind of weird because it kind of blends in with that rug and and so then you're like when you first look at it you're like why is the rug have a weird thing as opposed to oh that's a pencil <laughs> but you know hindsight's always 2020 right so once again you know, this book could have been green, it could have been black, it could have been any color. Um, these are kind of just choices you make, right? But, okay, let's see, back to our fun facts. Let's see if we can come up with another fun fact. Um... Do you know elephants can live like they say that it takes them 35 to 40 years to reach their full size, which is about half of their lifespan. So they live 70 to um, 80 years old. Cheetahs are the fastest land animal and they can hit speeds of 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour when running. So yeah, we have no we have no chance against the cheetah. <laughs> um, Victoria Falls is the largest waterfall in Africa, approximately twice as wide and twice as deep as Niagara Falls of North America. It's held it it's heralded as the world's greatest sheet of falling falling water. Okay. Um, the Ivory Coast got its name because people come to trade, which is now illegal 
in um, the tusks from elephants and I think rhinoceroses' horns or ivory too. Um, it's now illegal, I think, to even possess any of that stuff. Do you know that penguins live in Africa? Although endangered, there's a large colony of African pencil, peng, pencils, pencils, penguins that live near the Cape in South Africa. They're the only penguin species found in Africa. I'm surprised there even is any. I didn't think that they lived outside of cold regions. So I think that's interesting. Um, the island of Madagascar is the only place where wild lemurs naturally call home. And I believe there's a picture of a lemur. Is that how you say it? Lemur? Um, okay, so let's talk about our little cookie jar. So, I used brown ochre for the first one, went over it with the ivory, kind of going over these with ivory. Now the idea with these like jars and things like that, right? You see through the jar. So you want to color the things that are inside the jar first. Get, get all of those in. And then once those are all in, then later we'll come back and we will we'll add in the highlight areas that are going to really bring this jar to life. So just know I'm going to do all that at once with the Posca pen at the end. And that really makes, that's what makes it look like a jar. Because right now you're just like, okay, well, you can see the things, right? Now, as I add this gray color, I do feel like it starts to look more like a jar. And I'm going to add the dark, which will add a little bit more dimension. And then when I add the blue, that really, I think, kind of makes it look more like glass, right? But it isn't until the Posca pen that you're going to go, oh, that makes it look like a jar, in my opinion. So while all of these things help, like as I colored this part, it definitely helps. The Posca pen is what makes it look like glass. Now I decided here that I wanted to do um, like wood flooring like I did before. So I'm using the dark sepia because I don't want to have to erase pencil lines. Now the one thing I will suggest is as I'm adding these, um, I just did it. I was looking at the, the other page as a reference. So if you look at hers, the, the little lines kind of skew a little to the right on the right hand side and a little to the left on the left hand side. Not a lot. You don't want them diagonal. And for one reason that one really bugged me. The one thing I would do different here is I would darken up these lines right now because once I add in all my little flicks here then I lose track of where those main you know ridges were you know the slat the slats in between. Does that make sense? Because as I add these lines, then it becomes less obvious where those initial lines were, which you want to darken up to indicate that there are slats of wood. So do that first. Learn from me. <laughs> Your idiot in command. Learn from me because you can see I'm a little off on where these are. But basically you want to darken those up a little bit uh, just to indicate where the different boards are. And then um, that I'm just kind of evening it out a little bit. I had a couple of really long flicks there 
And I thought, well, while I'm at it, I'll just do it all the way across. And then I'm just going to bring in those same colors that we did when we colored the wood on the other side. So the key is with this um, sharpened pencil. Uh, flicks like you would do hair with a little more pressure and then a light stroke. And you can go either way, whatever way works best for you. But you want to leave space between your flicks for the next color. That way you get a good variance of color. Right? So I'm just going to work my way through these colors. Now this, this burnt ochre adds a, a richness to the wood. This is where you're getting what I call the richness, but kind of more the um, more of a golden color so that when you put that brown ochre, which is kind of a yellowish mustardy kind of color, um, that you're still getting that burnt, burnt ochre kind of pushing through the brown ochre. Right? And I really like this color of wood. Now, wood floors can be done in any color. You could have colored this a whole different color of wood. You could have, you don't even have to make it wood. You certainly don't have to put your little planks in if you don't want to. Um, you don't even have to color it at all if you don't want to. Now I'm going in, especially right at the edge of every little object. You can see it's a lot lighter because my flicks, I wasn't, tr I wanted to make sure I wasn't flicking into the object. So therefore I would stop a, a hair short. Well, then it just looks a little light. Now I'm not too worried about that carpet fringe because I'm gonna do with I'm gonna do that in Posca pen at the end. So I just flick right over it. I'm not even worrying about it at all. Now feel free to make your shadows as dark as you would like. This is a place where you can really add some contrast to your design. I chose not to be too dark, but I definitely added some shadows. Now, to balance out the entire picture, I am going to go up here to the top with the green. Finish your sentence, Wendy. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes my brain is like, um, thinks it's communicating when my mouth is not really doing a good job. I really like how this turned out. When I very first started the picture, I thought this is what I was going to do. But as always, I oftentimes leave these kind of decisions to the end because things will sometimes change in my mind. And I think, no, I need blue or I need red or, or whatever the color is. But I feel like the chair is such a big green element. We need some other green to balance that out. The same is on our other side. When we did our curtains and such, I decided to do the lamp and everything in the green to help balance that out. Let me get a drink. What are you guys drinking? I've got some coffee. I'm a cold, I like, I'm a cold coffee drinker. Even in the winter, um, I used to work for a guy that it absolutely killed him. He would, he'd say, I'm going to Starbucks. What do you want? And it'd be like 10 degrees out. And I'm like, I'll have a cold brew or like a nitro brew. <laughs> it used to almost kill him to have to buy it for me. But I've just never been a hot drink fan. And I know... All of y'all from the UK are probably like, what? Like, because I know that tea is a big thing and um, around here, coffee is a big thing. You know, 
but I just, I've never been a warm drink kind of girl. I like cold drinks. And so, um, now over the years, I used to drink it black and I still can. Um, but my body prefers if I temper it a little bit with some milk and I put just a little bit of stevia in it too. And it's kind of like a treat, you know, for me. I don't make it, it's still like a, it's like a Bistra color. <laughs> Maybe a touch lighter than Bistra, but um, that's kind of my new coffee favorite. Like I said, if I go to Starbucks or something, Nitro, the what is it called? Nitro Cold Brew. I hardly ever go to those places because I'm cheap. Guys, this is why I can buy pencils and color books because the idea of spending four to seven dollars on a cup of coffee, just I, and no judgment if you do it, my kids do it. Um, I always say everybody has that thing that they like to spoil themselves with and like um, my one son and his wife, they're big coffee fanatics. They have like a whole coffee station in their house with syrups and expensive coffee and a grinder and, and like the steam milk maker and all the things. And I'm like, that's awesome because that's what they love. It would, uh, it would be un used very much here at my house. My husband makes a pot of coffee and then what he essentially does is make hot cocoa and adds a little coffee to it. I laugh at him because he makes a very, like his coffee looks like tea. You can kind of see through it. And then, then he adds a lot of hot cocoa mix to it. And so it's basically hot cocoa with just a touch of you know, coffee added to it. Um, but that's what he loves. But he only drinks coffee usually on the weekends. Um, like he doesn't make it before work or anything. So, um, so, but people ask, you know, people ask me how I can afford to, to buy art supplies. Well, there you go. Okay, so our Karen Dosh blender, I just, I'm not going to film that. I literally go over everything. I will say if you're going to do it, just make sure that you don't spread color from one side to the other. So if you're working on your little red ball and you decide to um, go up into the little silver piece on the trunk, be careful. You could have some red on that blender and it will smear into your silver and it can be hard to get it out so just be mindful of that but I do like the look that it gives I feel like it works really nice with polychromos now here I'm just kind of going over um, adding some white at the end of those flowers now you'll notice I am not necessarily um, trying to get rid of the white lines. You can still see the, the black lines there. That wasn't my intent. It was just to make the, the tips a little lighter. Now here I'm just adding a little Posca on our camera, just on the edges, uh, just to make it look a little more shiny. I'm adding some, you know, just random little, they're not really random, I usually pick a side, like the right hand side of things, and I add just dots and dashes of color. And like there I thought that was too much. I'm going to go back over it later with a lightly with a colored pencil. Now if you make a mistake, it takes a second for this to dry. So just, you saw me, I put it on there and went nah. And you just kind of smear it out and, and do it again. Now, you can also do a patting effect, which sometimes if it's a little too stark, you can just 
put your finger right on it and lift up and it'll kind of mute it just a little bit and that can be very effective too. Now all of these little stars and dots and whatnot I'm just doing in Posca just um, you know once again that's a stylized choice we could have went in with an orange or a gray or a silver or you know whatever. Now I find sometimes when I'm highlighting it looks a little better to have like a little dash and a dot than a full on solid line. Um, this once again is just one of those things it's whatever you like and how much you do of this or don't do is 100% what you like. I think it kind of brings things to life a little bit when you do this, but like I said, the page, the page on the left hand side, I didn't do it at all. And I feel like that page turned out just fine. So there are just times when I feel like, um, I like the look of it better. Now on that little tea bag in retrospect, I probably wouldn't do that again but it's fine. Now I'm going over the edge of my little stickers here with the white, just so that the white on the edges stands out. You wanna go over your little silver. That'll help make it look more shiny. The more light and dark contrast you have, the shinier it's going to look. When you feel like your pen isn't coming out anymore, put the lid back on it, give it a good shake, maybe even prime it again. Um, because I find that sometimes when I'm doing this, about halfway through, I'm like, oh, I'm not really getting as much as I normally do. It's when I go in and reprime it. Now I'm going to zoom in here a little bit for you guys and watch how this glass suddenly, just with the little bit of white Posca there, it just makes it look transparent. Now, I am no expert in this, but those little white lines sure do make a big difference. The Posca can definitely be your best friend. <laughs> and I just look around and just, I don't know. I don't always do this right and over the years I've found what I like just by doing it and by years I mean year. <laughs> I decided I wanted all those dots to be kind of colored with the white so that it's more of a polka dot look. Now I will say be careful when you're using, Posca actually dries fairly fast, but you do have to give it a second or you can smear it. And you're gonna see me do that upcoming when I'm gonna use a black pen to add some of the black highlights or low lights. <laughs> now this is what's called a Sharpie pen. This is not a Sharpie. You got to be careful with Sharpie. Now, sometimes you can do Sharpie over wax or over colored pencils, I mean, and it won't go through your paper because your colored pencils have laid a barrier, but you have to be extremely careful. Sharpie marker will go through. The Sharpie pen does not. However, this Sharpie pen takes longer to dry. So, I would encourage you to work from the left-hand side of your page to the right-hand side if you're right-handed 
right hand side of the page to the left hand side if you're left handed. And if you have a heat gun, you can use that. But you're going to see down here at the bottom that book right here where I'm putting these dots. They look so, look how nice they look right now. Looks so good. You know what I do? Yeah, I smear it. I smear it and it looks like crap and I try and fix it and eh, it does not look near as good as it does right at this moment. So learn from my mistakes. Allow this stuff to dry. So, for, so far I'm doing good with it. <laughs> but right here I think is where I get a little smeary. Nope, right there. Full on put my hand in it. So you can see that there is a, you know, it does take a minute for it to dry. Now here I'm just kind of deepening up the shadows. We're nearing the completion of the page. So this is the time when you just step back, take a look, and see what you want to do. Now you see down there in the bottom right hand corner those little dots? Yeah, they're all smeary, which is annoying. Guys, I want to take a minute and just tell you how much I appreciate you. Thanks for putting up with me, putting up with all my little stories and rants. I hope you found today interesting. I hope you learned something, and I hope that we can learn more about Africa as we go along. I didn't like the highlights on the chair, so I kind of went over them. Um, once again, stylistic choice. Uh, certainly nothing wrong with them. It was just a choice I made. Um, now I'm going to draw in my fringe. Now one of the things I do is I flick through here and then you want to make sure that um, um, I'm going to use a dark pencil to even the line where it attaches to the rug. I don't care about the fringe as far as being different in terms of where they end. Anyway, thank you so much for following along with me. Please hit the like and subscribe button um, because I'd really like to see you on our journey to Africa. Um, as we color this book to completion, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot of interesting facts about Africa. Hopefully you'll learn some coloring things. Hopefully I'll learn some coloring things. And Thank you so much for commenting. That is my favorite part. When you guys comment, it lets me know what you like, what you don't like, what you're thinking, that you're actually watching. <laughs> All of the things. So I appreciate you so very much. Before I forget, check out my new website at jazzydoodledesigns.com. It has all of my latest video links as well as categories so you can find what you're looking for. Resources, so the Kofi shop is linked there along with some of my favorite products. There will be more to come in the book section, otherwise it's complete. So that's going to wrap it up. I hope you have a fantastic holiday. I hope that you do something relaxing and for yourself. Until the next time. Take care. Thank you for watching another video from Jazzy Doodle Designs. If you enjoy adult coloring content, please consider subscribing. You can now find me on Instagram and Facebook as well. I welcome all comments and suggestions. Don't forget to like the video before you go. And until next time, take care.